Um, so my name is Orit Bashkin. I'm a professor at the University of Chicago, um, and I work on two topics in particular. One is the history of Iraq and the Iraqi uh, Jewish community in it. Um, and I wrote a, sort of a trilogy on that. So The Other Iraq, which was about pluralistic uh, trends in Iraqi culture in the first half of the 20th century. Um, New Babylonians, which was the history of Iraqi Jews, and Impossible Exodus, which was the history of the Iraqi Jewish community in Israel. Um, I also work on the Arab cultural revival movement of uh, the late 19th century, early 20th century, about early exper experimentations with novels, with the press, with short stories. Um, and here I presented about the image of the Jew within uh, this kind of uh, new emerging writing of Arab Christians, Muslims uh, and Jews. So I uh, started studying um, Arabic in high school. I like the language um, in part because in Israel every Friday at five o'clock in the afternoon there was an Egyptian film and I really liked the films and my grandmother liked the films. I come from an Ashkenazi family but that was extremely popular. Um, and then I, uh, I went on a, a tour to Egypt when I was 12 with my parents. Um, and for an Israeli, that was a, an immense uh, experience, in part because I could see sort of the protagonists of the films that I liked on posters, uh, but in part also because of the political situation in Israel. It was like the first time I was like in an independent Arab country um, where I saw sort of Arab culture not under Israeli control. So that left a, a big... Uh, uh, I was a kid, but then we went back and, and I, I really liked Egypt. Um, and the other, um, the other issue was that as I continued studying Arabic, um, I, I, I studied it in high school and then in university. And in university I had uh, Palestinian teachers, but also Iraqi Jewish teachers. And I was very interested in how come these Iraqi Jews were now Israeli citizens or so drawn to uh, Middle Eastern culture to Arabic culture. So I guess the, the films and Egypt um, sort of a recognition that as an Israeli, I need to know Arabic, I need to know um, about Arab culture. Um, and then just, you know, sometimes you like a topic in the university. So I guess all these things together. So one of the interesting things to me was the great involvement uh, of Jews in the Arab left, especially in Iraq. Um, and in Israel, you sort of uh, tend to think about uh, middle, Jews of Middle Eastern descent voting for right wing parties because the uh, European uh, uh, parties or the Jewish European parties or the parties led by European Jews very much discriminated against them. Uh, in Israel, and as a response, uh, some voted for right-wing parties. Um, and I, I think in contemporary discussions, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, people don't talk about, you know, the left or people talk about the demise of the left. Uh, but if you work on Iraq, um, you know, to, uh, where there was very active uh, participants of Jews in unions, in leftist organizations, um, a whole world uh, opens up to you. Uh, and in some ways, this is a response to particular Iraqi conditions, because these folks are thinking, OK, so uh, socialism or communism or social democracy will be a response to sectarianism, to extremism. So they're, they're really uh, left leaning um, in that way. Uh, but at the same time, if you think about it globally, it's not that difficult from uh, Jewish organizations like the Bund or uh, the attractions of Jews to radical leftist organizations in Europe. So this kind of move between these very particular moments on the one hand uh, that are specific to Iraq, but also to Egypt, where there was a, a big involvement in the left. So those particular Middle Eastern moments on the one hand, and at the same time, on the other hand, this kind of global moments where you can actually think, OK, this Jew in Baghdad is doing something very similar to what a fellow Jew was doing in Argentina um, or in New York or in Berlin. Um, that was very interesting.
One of the last articles that I've written was about uh, three communist Jewish women um, who all converted to Islam in order to uh, stay uh, in Iraq and not be deported to Israel. Um, and, and how, you know, on the one hand they're leftists, but on the other hand they want to stay in Iraq, so their cultural choice is, you know, to, to adopt this uh, identity. But what is but, but think about what, what does that mean? Um, and it's also, again, in terms of, um, you know, revealing things, uh, these women were very much involved in uh, prison resistance movement, organizing hunger strikes, uh, protesting uh, the situation of political prisoners in the 1950s. Back then is different because back then depends on um, a particular context. So I would say that um, you have to contextualize this between two narratives. So one narrative that is very much influenced by the Arab-Israeli conflict will say Jews were always persecuted by Muslims. Um, and they suffered and they were second-class citizens and they were dhimmis. Um, and then you can actually show the numbers. And it is true that um, the, in, in terms of people killed, um, there were much uh, less pogroms, riots, um, attacks on Jews, um, even prior to the Holocaust in uh, the Muslim world. Um, so that's one narrative. A second narrative is to sort of say, oh, it was always coexistence between Jews and Muslims. Look at Muslim Spain and everybody got along together. And that's also problematic and that's also nostalgic because um, in many of these societies, the hegemony was preserved for um, for uh, Muslim Sunnis, whether they were the Ottomans or later on the Arabs. So it's, um, it, it's a, a different kind of a, a, re, um, a reality, at, at least in the spaces that, that I work on. Um, ha so I would say that the relationship between Jews and Muslims in general is a product of context. Uh, even the relationship between Jews and Muslims in Berlin is different than the relationship between Jews and Muslims in Tel Aviv. Obviously, it's intertwined, um, and what happens in Israel affects what happens in uh, Europe and vice versa, but, but the specificities are also important. Um, and so I would say that the, the very, very um, important difference, let's say, if I think about... Uh, the relationship until 1948, or let's say until World War um, II, uh, like 38 or something like that, is that, or World War One, let's say late 19th century, but even until 48 or 41 or 38, is that there was hope. So despite all the, all the problems, there was hope that some kind of an ism, some kind of an ideology, uh, whether it's nationalism or communism or socialism, um, would bring about um, kind of a, a solution to sectarianism, to ethnic tensions. Um, and there was also an openness within this kind of interfaith conversations. Um, and it wasn't universal, but in many places you can find it. And, and this optimism, I think, was also a sheer product of people living next to one another. I mean, in societies like Lebanon, Iraq, um, Syria, Egypt, uh, Jews and Muslims lived uh, side by side. Um, and then with the rise of actually some of the things that were envisioned as solutions, whether it's nationalism, but especially uh, later on with the deterioration of the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, the indigenous Jewish populations uh, of the Middle East were displaced uh, in many places after the 1948 war. This experience of uh, shared existence um, where you have Jews and Muslims living together um, is, um, is gone in most Middle Eastern uh, countries. Um, and this idea that you, know, you, you celebrate different holidays, you kind of enjoy this uh, multiculturalism that was a product of living in a multicultural empire, uh, this is gone nowadays in, in many uh, spaces. And then again in Israel, yes, Jews and Muslims are living together, but it's a, it's a product of a particular um, kind of power relations, um, which is very different than, than what has been in the past.